<laughs> okay, I'm going to talk to you about a sort of general introduction to race walking, which is an event group within track and field. Uh, race walking is a competition to get from A to B as fast as possible within two rules. Now, when I'm coaching race walking, I don't start by telling anyone the rules because this really disturbs them and their mechanics. They spend the next two hours wondering about what they can't do rather than what they should be doing. But it di doesn't differ from a very great number of other endurance sports. You consider, for example, freestyle swimming. It's like running. You can do it any way you want to get from A to B, either in water or on land. In the same way, butterfly is modified freestyle. It's got some rules that you follow. And race walking is like butterfly. It's simply an endurance sport that has some rules of movement. Now, within the things that we have control of with an athlete, I like to draw a box with a two by two grid in it to help remember all of the things we can work on. And I've put these in this order, psychology is up here, biomechanics, error avoidance and physiology. And they're not in any particular order, uh, but most people focus on physiology of training. Um, there, there's a great tendency to think that if you're doing running, long distance running or race walking, um, that physiology is it, that's training, that's it. It's, it's going out and doing five miles today, a week with 120 kilometers in it, doing some speed work and so on. And it tends to ignore the other three areas, which is why it's useful to have this grid. Now the other areas, this symbol here is psi from the Greek, and it's an abbreviation for psychology. That's the science of mental life. It's how we think about things, and it's quite applicable to sport. Uh, it's essential that we set rational, reasonable goals for ourselves or we'll be disappointed. And within the context of race walking, a rational and reasonable goal is to better your own performance. Don't try to go for a specific time because it's a qualifying time if you can avoid it. Try to go by what you have done in the past and to improve on it. And you'll find that you're much more satisfied with that rather than competing against another individual who might be having a particularly good day or a particularly bad day. Also within sports psychology, probably the, one of the more useful things that, that we tell athletes, young athletes, is listen to your inside voice and make sure that it is positive all the time. And that's in training as well as racing. Inside voice, uh, if you imagine you have a little dialogue going on in your head, it's the voice, you're talking to yourself. If you're in a race and you start saying, oh, I've missed my splits, I'm off pace, it's going badly, you are now telling yourself to perform badly. One of the most useful things that, that we've been taught by the sports psychologists is to keep it positive. If you start to feel negative um, uh, feelings during your race, Stop them immediately. And you can do that by having a set phrase or phrases that you're going to fall back on. And these should be positive. Positive affirmations that say, yes, I can do this. I've done the training. I am this good. Yes, this is going to be fine. Whatever happens, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to do the best I can. Positive thoughts like that. You need to be your own best cheerleader. Uh, I'd also recommend looking for some texts on sports psychology, and there are quite a number of those. Um, there are Jim Lur, uh, Mental Toughness Training uh, books. Um, there's uh, Magical Running by McGee is another one which is uh, worth looking at. But there's any number of them. And if you get on to, uh, online and just start looking up sports psychology books, uh, you can find some good ones, and even if you go to Barnes & Noble or uh, at some bookstore, they quite often have books on sports psychology. And it's worth reading up on it because you may find that this is an area that you've simply ignored. It's just, it's just how it happens. And you can gain quite a bit of an advantage and improvement in your performance by uh, actually addressing sports psychology as an area. 
Biomechanics is very, very important in race walking. As I said, we're going from A to B as fast as possible, but we have two rules. Now those rules require us to move in certain ways. We want to make sure that the way that we're moving is as efficient as possible, so that we don't waste energy, and legal. Now, we don't want to just focus on the legality of it. We certainly want to be within the rules, but the way that has been solved with modern walking technique to go as fast as possible is within the rules. Um, I am also going to uh, record a section in which I talk about uh, the biomechanics and the optimum technique. Now, in improving the way that you move, probably the most important thing that we have is feedback. That is giving the athlete information about the way they move. We could do this in several ways. The most common is simply to have a coach observe them and give them instruction or shout to them to make corrections. Uh, to simply become aware of a flaw makes it a lot easier to address it. If you're doing something wrong and you're training on your own, you can spend a long time rehearsing that error uh, rather than doing anything about it. So have somebody walk through. And if that's not uh, available for an athlete, uh, it's always good to get them filmed and to have that video clip emailed to a coach somewhere who could look at it and look for any flaws. Uh, another good method, and I think you've all just experienced this, is to get on a treadmill with cameras set up around it so that you can actually see yourself in real time and make corrections with somebody critiquing you. And you can see very rapidly, as they say, tighten the arm angle. You can see the changes that makes and feel the difference it makes. Error avoidance. Now this comes down to experience, but it also we have to learn from this experience. Error avoidance can mean not only avoiding something going wrong, but reinforcing things that go right. So if you find something that upsets your stomach by eating it before or during a race, you need to avoid it. And if you find something that works really well, you eat a particular meal the night before a race and you felt really good, it's certainly worth experimenting with that again. I also say do everything and rehearse everything you possibly can in non-race situations before you try them out in a race. So if you're trying some new sport drink, or some new eating, um, a new sleeping pattern, a new pair of racing shoes, any of these things, try them out in training several times before the big day, the target event. And the way that we make sure that we learn from this experience, take notes. Sounds old fashioned, but keep a log. And a log doesn't have to be an immensely detailed breakdown of every 200 meter split that you've ever walked. It can be as simple as, I walked three miles today, felt really good, the sun was out. Uh, those kind of notes are, are useful to look back on from a psychological standpoint. They reinforce for you that you have done the work. But also write down when things go right and when they go wrong. If you're preparing for a race, let's say you have a local 5K race, uh, you can look back and see what you did for two or three days, maybe for an entire week before that race, and uh, see whether that worked for you so that you know if you're getting ready for example for national outdoor championships or national masters indoors whatever race here is some pattern of training that worked very well in the days leading up to a race I'll repeat that pattern because for me as an individual it works okay so learn from your experience and take notes now within physiology the physiology of training race walkers is the same as for any other endurance athlete. The difference is we are mechanically less efficient. Uh, a runner might go 10 miles in one hour and in the same amount of time approximately a, a race walker of the same quality might go 10 kilometers in an hour. That's very approximate but it will give you an idea of what's happening. So to say, well, walking's easier because you, you're not going as fast is inaccurate. It's rather like the logic, cyclists go much faster than runners, therefore they're fitter. Or swimmers go much slower than runners, therefore they're nowhere near as fit. It just doesn't work that way. Now, 
Uh, we can take a physiology book, which is a standard training book, um, Jack Daniels, third edition, um, or Law of Running, Tim Notes, any of the texts, Pete Fitzinger's book, any of these texts, and we can apply it to race walkers. And we do that by looking at the amount of time they have put in a schedule and the amount of effort or heart rate. If I tell a group of runners, you're going to go and run an interval that's going to take you four minutes, and you're going to do it at 85% of your maximum heart rate, and you're going to have four minutes rest, and you're going to do it seven times. I can take the exact same thing and give it to a race walker and say, you're going to do four minutes work at 85% max heart rate, you're going to do it seven times with the same recovery between. And the walker will not cover the same distance, because they're mechanically limited by our two rules, but they will do the same amount of work. You'll see the same heart rate, the same oxygen uptake, and the same type of conditioning resulting from it. So it's actually quite easy to convert endurance training for runners over to endurance training for race walkers. There are some, uh, some things that, that uh, are not unique to race walkers, but that I like to stress because they are of particular importance. Microcore. Microcore is the idea that we do our core training for endurance. Race walking events, the very shortest race walking events, take 12 minutes. Now for a running event, that's, that's definitely middle to long distance running. Now, our longest events, on the other hand, go up to four, five hours. Uh, for the very best people, three hours and 32 minutes for a 50 kilometer race walk. So quite a, quite a considerable distance further than a marathon. Now, microcore is the idea that we reinforce the stabilizing muscles, particularly in the midriff of the body, and also some of the uh, muscles in the lower back and butt, because we use them a lot when we're walking. But we're not trying to gain sufficient strength to be able to do a sit-up and throw a medicine ball at the same time for the entire length of a gymnasium. What we're trying to do is to develop muscles that can operate maintaining our body in a stable fashion without it wobbling around the place when we're landing on a straight leg at great speed for hour after hour. So what we want to do is to develop these muscles around here uh, in an endurance capacity. Microcore is the idea that, that the best way to do this is to train two or three times a day for very short bursts. Six minutes, eight minutes of core training split up into one, two, three sessions a day, whatever you've got time for. So you're waiting for the shower to warm up, which takes a while in our house. You just put the towel down and do some core work for, for six minutes. There's one session for the day. Um, six minutes is also rather good in that you really don't get sweaty in that time. So it's something you can kind of sneak in at the office as a wake you up between work sessions. But what we're really doing with it is to develop this tremendous strength, and we've seen this in some of the elite athletes. As we watch film of them, we see this, their waistband hardly oscillate from the, the horizontal rotation, even with the leg landing straight, because they've got so much core strength. Um, tapering. Tapering is the idea that we're going to take, uh, we're going to take the amount of training that we do what? Yeah. I was going to, I just want to know if we could ask questions. Um, let's do say so ask questions at the end. Okay. Okay. All right. That'll, that'll, no, that's all right. No, it's a good, it's a good point. Yeah, we, we'll do that. And so if we get some good question and answer things at the end, we'll just edit them in. Okay. That'll work. Okay. So tapering is the idea that we are going to take the volume and intensity of our training and bring it down, to taper it down as it were to a point for a major race. Now if we simply took the amount of training we're doing and we just kept going right through a race, wham, into that race, we're not going to perform as well as we possibly can. There's some very good research originally done by David Costell at Paul State on swimmers and he showed that some sort of tremendous cutbacks in volume, like halving the volume for three weeks before a race, actually improved performance. That was some of the first research. And it's become more and more refined since then. 
and there are a lot of suggestions that the optimal taper for the types of races that we're generally involved in as race walkers are three to six days and they involve not cutting back and resting completely. That's not a good idea. What we need to do is to maintain our movement patterns so that we don't lose skill and economy at speed. We want to maintain the enzymes in the muscles that we've built up to maintain our threshold velocity. That's the speed at lactate threshold. And um, psychologically, to stay fresh. But we want to do it without becoming more tired or at least recovering from the backlog of tiredness we might have from our training. So what we do is we do a short warm-up, for example, 800 meters of walking, half a mile of walking. And then we'll do some repetitions, for example, 400 meter repetitions, maybe five or six of them, at threshold velocity. And in most cases, you can estimate that as being about your five kilometer race walk speed. So you're going to go one lap of the track at a speed that you can do for 12 and a half laps. Now this sounds counterintuitive. Stay with me on this. We're going to now take about a two minute rest and we'll repeat, maybe do five or six of these and then we'll do a very short warm down, about half a mile. A total volume of work, maybe two miles of work. Uh, for somebody who's coming off a hundred mile week, that's absolutely tiny amount. Now the purpose of walking at threshold velocity is to maintain those things that I mentioned, to maintain our neuromuscular coordination at speed, to maintain the enzyme systems required to, to keep lactate threshold as high as possible. And it also gives them a feeling of getting the cobwebs out of the system. It's also useful in that it's, it's about the top end pace for a 5K and somewhat slightly above target pace for 10K, 20 and 50 kilometers. So when they get into those races, they won't feel like they're suddenly jumping in and having to do something much faster than, than they're used to. Uh, again, we've talked about error avoidance. And I would say tapering is something that you can try out and learn and try to find something that works for you. So experiment with tapers and take notes. Find the one that works for you as an individual. I've put the word Bilat down here. This is named for Veronica Bilat, a researcher from France. And she's done a lot of work on increasing maximum velocity. Now, if we're out there walking 20 or 50 kilometers, you might be thinking, what's the use of being able to sprint 100 meters in a race walk as fast as possible? So I actually found that your speed, your um, velocity, that just elicits maximum oxygen uptake is a very important predictor of your maximum race ability. And she came up with several training methods that will help to improve that. Um, and they can be put in early in the season. And they answer the question that, that I've often heard. Um, people say, well, how do I go faster? And the answer from a lot of old coaches is, well, you go faster. Well, that's not very helpful, is it? So how do we do this? Uh, we break it down, we break the training down into short sections. For example, she used 30 seconds. So that's a short enough period of time that you can focus on good technique to maintain your biomechanics to be both legal and efficient. They will drive you at a high speed so that you have to stay coordinated, but then we take lots of recovery because tiredness is the enemy of good technique. And, uh, if you're doing a session of these, you might do something, for example, 15 by 30 seconds of fast work with 15, but with 30 seconds of recovery between. I'm sorry, I'll repeat that. Um, this might consist of 15 repetitions of 30 fast seconds of work with 30 seconds of easy recovery in between. Uh, clearly from the way it's structured, it came about from doing things on a treadmill, which is not always available to us, and it's not always the best, best thing for some people. They, they might be unaccustomed to a treadmill. Yes, I see nonsense. Um, so uh, you can do a modified version of this. For example, bends and straights, uh, straight away, should be taking you somewhere between 25 and 35 seconds. Uh, only the very fastest people are going to be much quicker than that and might need to extend the distance. And then you take your recovery time around the bend. 
uh, that's that's one method of doing this. Obviously, it's going to give you more recovery than she had in her system. Uh, my answer to that is simply do more repetitions. Um, what we're trying to do is to improve our maximum velocity, not necessarily to, to learn how to deal with tiredness. So, how do we set our goals? We need to have not only long-term goals, but we need to set, have stepping stones towards them. And as I said, these goals need to be oriented towards us personally. They need to be individual goals. How can I be better? Now, if your long-term goal is to race in August of next year at the World Masters Championships, or in June at the National Outdoor Championships, or in July at the National Junior Olympics, you can't look at it and say, well, the winning time last year was such and such, I need to go that fast. You need to look at it and say, I'm going to go as fast as I can at that event. And our stepping stones leading up to it will have us accelerating leading up to it. So we might go to some local races, a local 5K race or whatever, and see how we're doing and have goals of being better at that time. And it will also give us an idea of what our target time should be like given the expected conditions of that race. Now, the other thing that I like to suggest is please think of yourself not only as an athlete. Think of yourself as a coach and a judge as well. These changing viewpoints are very useful. If you simply think of yourself as an athlete and you ignore the way these things are done, you won't have as complete an experience and also you won't learn as well. If I tell you that you need to be able to coach this and you're talking about biomechanics, you not only have to know for yourself where your elbow should be, but you have to be able to put it into words to explain to this beginner over here who's never race walked before what they're supposed to be doing. And if you can explain to them what they're supposed to be doing, you can certainly remind yourself in a race what you should be doing. And on that note, I'm going to mention something which comes under error avoidance that I call body checks. Body check is where you set a mark every so often in a race. For example, on a track, you might say, every time I go through the 200 meter mark, I'm going to do a body check. In a road course, they're almost invariably loop courses for race walking. You might have the same thing. Every time I go past that 500 meter marker, I'm going to do a body check. What you're going to do is very consciously go through your body position. Are my eyes up at the horizon? Are my shoulders relaxed? Are my arms and shoulders in a nice low position? Are my arms at about 90 degrees or a, or a tighter angle than that? Am I running my hands and forearms so they drive along the hips? Am I rotating my hips? Am I landing with a straight leg with my heel right under my belly button? Am I getting my foot out behind me and popping off the toe? You will have gone through this so many times in training and in other races that that sequence of checking will be second nature to you. So remember your body checks. So being a coach, being able to coach makes you a better athlete. I also suggest that learning how to judge makes you a better athlete. You'll understand better what is going through their heads. What are they doing? Are they out to get you? No, it's a very, very difficult thing. They are using their best judgment to call what they see. And what are they looking for? Once you've been through some courses on how to judge, you'll be more aware of those things. And it actually takes some of the pressure off as an athlete because you know the judges are fallible, they're looking at your legs, they're not trying to disqualify you because of any personal animus, they aren't even looking who you are because things are happening so fast. They are just concerned with making sure it is a legal and fair playing surface that we are on. So, that's my brief summary of this. When you are writing a training schedule, set your goals, set long-term goals, put stepping stones along the way, and make sure that you have psychology, biomechanics, physiology, and error avoidance having some role within your training schedule.